Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Doing Well, the Wellbeing Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Lungo, coming to your ears from NARM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's learn together. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Doing Well. And on this week's episode, we are going to talk about the concept of stealing time. Very interesting wordings and choice of wordings, uh, but I'm excited to talk about this concept with our guest of the day today, who has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, But today's topic is something in particular that we're going to dive deep into. I'll get her to introduce herself in a little bit, and I'll introduce her right now. So Carrie Knowles is an award-winning artist and author with a passport the size of a library, and she's joining us virtually today. We had some technical difficulties earlier, but she's been so wonderful and patient, so I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for being here, Carrie. Here, Thank you for inviting me and for being patient with my technical difficulties. That's we, okay. We're long distance here, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? This is actually really cool. So, you know, when you really think about it, booking a flight versus troubleshooting it on the go, eh, I think that's actually okay. We made it, and yeah. Fun to be over with you guys again. I love <laughs> it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually saw that you have a you had a project that was uh, on display here in Brisbane in 2017, didn't you? I did, yeah. Um, my husband and I actually... Um, uh, my husband received a, a, not a fellowship, but he was invited to teach at Brisbane yeah, at um, QUT, Queensland University of Technology. And we lived in Brisbane the first time for a year. And while we were there, um, I did some work. Um, I'm most of an author and also a, an artist. And uh, wound up doing some work with Brisbane Institute of Arts. And then... Um, we came back and then for, I think, four months the second time. And then in 2017, I was invited to be one of seven international artists for a special exhibition in Brisbane at BIA. Um, and we were all dual artists, people who had uh, two different modes of creativity. And I was asked to pull together um, a, a project for this show. And and usually when you get invited to shows like this, you get about 18 months to two years to develop something. And the title of the show was The Inevitable Past. And um, so I began work and, you know, struggled with the concept of what was inevitable. And um, the uh, Trevor, who was the curator of the show, called me and said, so we had the the, you know, we've done the work for how we want the show to lay out and you have a 30 foot wall. And I have a, a, a very special suitcase that I travel with artwork in and it, it fits work that's a certain size, it's kind of small because it's a suitcase. And all of a sudden I imagine, oh my gosh, I'm trying to do these pieces and I have a 30 foot wall. And I said, Trevor, I'm like, I have a 30 foot wall. He said, yes, do you want more? And I said, oh, absolutely not. And uh, we talked a little bit about the inevitable past and what they were expecting me to do and about using my writing as a way to come off into my artwork. And I got off the phone and I thought, what in the world am I going to do? And also, what am I going to do for 30 feet? Um, and I, at that point, I had less than a year left on my time to create this show for uh to take to Australia. And I realized that there had been a story I had never told and a story that had bothered me, but I didn't have enough information. And very quickly, um, it was about my father's mother who was found in 1902. Uh, She was found unconscious on a a 
train platform in Macon, Georgia. And she was very pregnant. She didn't have a wedding band. She didn't have a purse. She didn't have any identification. And uh, long story short, she was taken to the um, home for unwed mothers. And she, uh, the doctor examined her and realized that she was pretty far along in her pregnancy, but also knew that she was going to not make it. She was going to die. And they decided to do a C-section. And the baby was my father. And nobody ever um, claimed the body. They never found out who the woman was. And so this, you know, who my grandmother was, who my father's mother was, became a giant mystery that sort of, in a way, haunted me my whole life. And, and, and I realized that after talking to Trevor and realized that I thought a thousand times about who am I, you know, who, who is the grandmother in me? You know, what, what part of her is me? And um, so I wrote the first page um, of a, uh, what turned out to be a novel called The Inevitable Past. And I realized that the grandmother was speaking from the grays and that um, she was speaking to her granddaughter. And I thought about it a while and I wrote this statement and then I wound up creating, you know, Penelope in the Odyssey. You know, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, she's known for uh, working on a tapestry and then taking it apart at night and working on a tapestry and taking it apart to get the suitors not to bother her. Um, and the reason why the suitors didn't bother her was because it was the law at that time that a daughter-in-law would create the shroud for her father-in-law. And I realized that I could create a shroud for my grandmother. So it became this 27 foot shroud. And I embroidered the, uh, all the words from the beginning of the book on antique linen and dyed the shroud like a DNA chain and then wove the embroidered words onto this big shroud. And that was my piece for the show. Mm. Um, let me just point out here that I, I didn't know how to embroider when I did this. So I had to teach myself how to embroider. So it became this huge project. And of course the, t the clock was ticking about, you know, hurry up there. You got to get this going. And then, then a book came up and I wrote a novel called the inevitable past about, um, about this grandmother. So mm. long explanation. And so I came back to Brisbane and spent another three months and saw friends and did a couple art projects and did this show and it was fun. Well, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That was before I moved to Australia. So I hadn't, didn't have the opportunity to see it in person, but you know, hopefully someday it'll, it'll come back maybe to Melbourne. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I, we loved it there. We really mm, did. Beautiful. So um, I'm now curious because obviously you have so much in your work, um, not just uh, that piece that was displayed here in Australia, but I was going through your bio and saw that you did a lot of different things. You know, you wrote so many books, novels, um, articles, and things like that. So can you share a bit more with us about your professional journey, especially why, you know, why it happened the way it happened and why you chose to do the work that you did, that you've been doing? Um, so, uh, my parents didn't have a lot of money. And in order for me to go to college, um, and at, you know, I had to work. Um, and at that time, you could actually work and pay for your way through school, which I don't think is possible anymore in the United States, at least. And um, one of the first jobs I got while I was in college was working for a radio station. And I wrote um, advertising copy and jingles and radio things. And... Uh, then I, I went on and I, uh, my last two years of college, I paid for my last two years of college by writing um, sports articles for our Michigan sports magazine. And I would leave school on Friday afternoons and I would travel with the editor and a photographer and a mechanic. And I would cover drag car, speedboat and motorcycle races all over the state of Michigan. And I would go home on Sunday night and I would write up all my articles and I would turn them in Monday morning and then I would go back to school. And so that's how I paid for school the last two years. And then I realized, you know, this is what I knew how to do. And, and um, 
and it was fun and I liked it. Uh, and so I began, I just went from writing in college to pay for college to writing professionally and did a lot of advertising work, a lot of promotional work. Um, I loved radio. If somebody invited me to do radio again, I would do it in a heartbeat. I loved radio. Um, and then, you know, I was a published poet and um, I love short stories. I began writing and publishing short stories. I wrote for a lot of magazines and I, I had to pay for things. I had to, um, that was what I did professionally. And so magazines and newspapers pay more than books pay. And so my books came later in my career, but, you know, all of the articles that I wrote that paid for the rent and everything else, you know, sort of were the beginning of my career. Wow. Fascinating. Um, yeah. I have hundreds of articles and you know, I don't even put them on my website or anything anymore because it's like, okay, fine, whatever, you know, <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I and I write this column for Psychology Today, which is I think how you found me, and uh, which is fun. It's a personal perspectives column, and mm -hmm. I get to write about just things that interest me in the world. Oh, beautiful! Well, that's so fascinating. Um, it's, you've obviously had a very long and um, successful career so far, and I think it's just fascinating to learn about how it all came to be. Uh, and I'm sure you're very busy as well. So today's topic is probably perfect. You know, the concept of stealing time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that and dive deeper into that in a little bit. Before we do that, we have a section called, Have You Met Carrie? I'm going to get some of your recommendations for some things that we think would highlight who a person is. And this is my favorite section to get to know the guest. My first question is, what is a book you would recommend? Mm, you know, I read that book question and my first response was, oh, my God, I don't want to write another book. Uh, shoot. Um, I have a lot of books that I like. Um, I adored The Once and Future King. Um, I I read a lot of fiction and nonfiction, tremendous amount of fiction and nonfiction. Uh, I'm trying to think about what I'm reading. Now, I'm reading uh, Brady and Sweetgrass right now, which is a a uh, selection of memoirs uh, by um, an ecologist, which is quite wonderful. Um, just, I, I, I read all the time, uh, obviously, that's what you do. Uh, but, you know, book has to grab me very quickly and keep me for a while before I uh, move on to the next thing. I don't know mm -hmm. if that would any help. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I think that's uh, that's really insightful to hear. And I love that you you said you love reading fiction, because I think a lot of people when they're on the show they're kind of like, oh, I have to suggest something really serious. But no, actually, no. fictions no. are great. <laughs> Not at all. And you know, I I I love um, a lot of kinds of fiction that I don't. I'm very drawn to fiction I don't write um, because I want to see what somebody else, how somebody else is looking at the world. Um, so, you know, I don't write espionage books. So I, I read them because, you know, they've got all these moving parts to them. And it's very fascinating to me to see how another writer approaches a topic in a way I wouldn't approach it. Yeah. Um, and so I'm always drawn to books that are different than I might be writing. Yeah, beautiful. And what is a movie you would recommend? Oh, really? I would recommend Barbie. Ah, <laughs> uh, yay! Hey. I love Barbie. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's, a, you know, for romantic movies, I, I love the book Out of Africa um, by Isaac Dennison, and I love the movie. Um, I love uh, action movies. Isn't that funny? What a surprise. I love action movies and, <laughs> you know, the recent... Harrison Ford movie was fun. Um, I like going to the movies more than watching television, although with COVID, everybody wound up watching television instead of going to the movies, which is back to the topic of stealing time. You know, I loved going to the movies because nobody could call me. Nobody could ask me to do anything. I couldn't change the laundry. I didn't have to cook dinner. It was like, you know, yeah. just me sitting there watching. Saw a fabulous movie over the weekend, uh, up close with Vermeer, 
about the um, the uh, the girl with the flute. It, it, it was about the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam trying to pull together. It was a non. It was a documentary about uh, they were trying to pull together this big show of Vermeer's work. And of course, Vermeer only made about thirty-seven paintings in his lifetime, and um, you know they were trying to get as many together. And then one of the paintings, the girl with the flute, it was uh, the Rijksmuseum said, "Oh, um, this is this is a Vermeer," and the the National Gallery in Washington D.C. said, "We don't think it is." We think it's somebody else. And so there was this international thing going on about, was it a Vermeer? Was it? Anyway, it, it's a great movie. You can see it on, I think Amazon has it on, but it's great. Mm, interesting. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll see if we have that in Australia on Amazon Prime. Um, cool. What is a podcast you would recommend, Kerry? Your podcast. Come on. Thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you for that. Um uh, I see that you've been on a few podcasts, actually, on your uh, yeah on your website, right? Yeah, yeah, and there are many more, um, but a lot of them have to do with the writing life. Um, you know, uh, I have a book about writing, and so that I get asked quite frequently to talk about that. And then the Alzheimer's book, I get asked frequently to talk about that. the The Alzheimer's book is the last childhood, and it's about the impact of Alzheimer's on the family members and what the dynamics are with that. And it was one of the first books that came out to look at that issue. And that's a big issue because from onset to death is on average 17 years. So that's a lot of years of caretaking and people need to recognize that and to understand that that's a huge commitment and also a tremendous psychological impact for the family members to deal with that for so long. It's a big loss. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes I get asked to talk about fiction. Sometimes I get asked to talk about, like today, I'm getting asked to talk about um, my column, which is fun. So, you know, when you write a lot of different things, you get invited a lot of different places. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, very fascinating bodies of work. And today we get to talk about something else, right? Uh, like you were saying, your column. So we'll dive into that very soon. Now, I wonder who your famous role model is, or it could be a role model in your life. It doesn't have to be a famous person. Um, For the last couple of years, I've been working with two of my uh, special role models. Uh, One of them is Mary Cassatt, the painter, and the other one is Eleanor Roosevelt. And I find these two women extremely fascinating And I've thought for years about, wouldn't it be interesting if they had a conversation? And so um, I have all over my office piles of research. Um, I've been doing a lot of research about the two women and realizing that at some point about two years ago, I realized that although their lives appear to be very different, one was a painter and the other one was, you know, a president's wife. that their lives were very similar. And uh, we live part-time in Washington, D.C. and part-time in Oberlin, Ohio. And so this is a great resource for me to do research here with the National Gallery. Um, And I'm also a a playwright. I've written a couple of plays, small ones. And so this was my first foray into writing a full-length play. I am almost to the end of it. And I have come to find these women, you know, I I was first drawn to them because they were so phenomenally successful and outspoken and strong and did such amazing work uh, in their lives. And then the more I studied both of them, the more I realized that they were very human and had um, doubts and questions about who they were and what they did. And that's a lot what the play is about. So it's been quite interesting, you know, to to take two of my heroes or sheroes or whatever you want to call them and to really take a very, very close look and do a lot of research about them and realize how normal they are. Yeah. Wonderful to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Final question in this part. 
What is a course you completed that left a really strong impact on you? Yes. Well, I don't know. You know, I I usually have taught courses more than well than taken them. And uh, in 2014, I was the North Carolina Piedmont Laureate in um, uh, short fiction, and I wound up creating. Uh, as the laureate, you know, one of your jobs is to do these workshops. Um, and I did 40 workshops in 10 months all over uh, five counties in North Carolina. And um, the people who attended my workshops were very, very different than other people who had uh, taken classes from me. Um, you know, the, I, I'm used to dealing with college students or graduate students who have, uh, you know, a broad experience with literature and with writing in general. And my job is to keep them focused and getting and, you know, making the best of what they have. And all of a sudden I'm the Piedmont Laureate and, and I'm doing all these workshops and the people who came to my workshops uh, were not college graduates or they were lawyers or doctors who'd never had any literature classes or writing classes. And so it, everything I had, my big bucket of, you know, how to teach these things just evaporated. And I had to create a new way to, um, to get people to feel comfortable, give them the tools they needed to move forward with writing. And so that became itself uh, another book about, about a writing workshop book. Mm. It actually has this long title. You know, people yeah. say, well, how did it get that long title? I said, well, because my publisher wanted this title. You know, which was fine. You know, you fight your own battles. You figure out what's important to you. So, but if you if you just go online and you say uh, writing writing workbook novels, K N O W L E S, you'll see it. You'll find it. Um, yeah. But so that was really a challenge, and it made me, I think, a better teacher and a better writer. And yeah. I had a lot of people who went on to write stories, which was great. Very nice. And I hope that you have a book about it as well so other people can pick that up and learn for themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have covered the section of Have You Met Carrie? We've got to know you so much better now. Let's talk about today's topic, which is the concept of stealing time. And it's in the context of well-being. So, of course, I have to ask you, Carrie, what does well-being mean to you personally? Um, I thought this was a very interesting question. Um, I think well-being is a state of mind where you feel comfortable with who you are and um, it lets go of, it has nothing, you know, the article I wrote about this, you know, well-being has nothing to do with how productive you are or, you know, that I have nine books, you know, that has nothing to do with my well-being. Trust me, I can tell you this right up straight front. <laughs> You know, it has nothing to do with everything I've published. And it really doesn't have anything to do with what we do with our jobs, with the, you know, with the, with the concept of productivity, how productive we are. It really has to do with, can we find that place where um, we can let all, we don't have to have all those identifiers. We can just be ourselves, not carry the writer or carry the artist or, Lou, the producer, or Lou, the interviewer, but just who is Lou? Who is Carrie? And, and that's where well-being, I think, really rests. And that's where it is, is a sense yeah. of um, who you are. You know, when you take all that other stuff away, when you get rid of that idea, well, I've done this, and well, I've done that. Well, who cares, you know? Are you, are you comfortable with yourself? Are you comfortable in the world? Do you feel good about yourself? And that is where I think well theory being lies. Yeah, hundred percent. I love that perspective because we are so attached to the idea that we are what we do and we are what we produce. And you know, without the things that we have made, we're no one. And I, I think that's such a toxic way of looking at ourselves and our sense of well being, right? Because well being is the complete opposite of that. I, I guess in a way, without anything, without us producing anything let's say what people call meaningful or impressive, do we actually enjoy our lives or, you know, this very moment right now? Um, and I think that's just 
really hard to achieve in this culture nowadays because it's always about, okay, productivity. What are you producing? What have you been doing the past week, the past month, the past year? And there's that pressure, you know, I, I, I can see that pressure. And in fact, this year for me is kind of like that. You know, I look at the year and I'm like, what have I done this year? Actually, not much, but I do enjoy my life. And I feel like there's that pressure to feel, oh, I should have done more. Isn't that terrible? I mean, you know, it's like, can you be a happy person yeah. without having to have a list of things you've produced? Yeah. You know, be a good person. Can you be comfortable in your own skin, I guess, is well-being, you yeah. know, without having to put on, you know, um, I remember our youngest son lived with us when we lived in Australia and he went to Brisbane State High and, you know, he got like everybody who went to that school a pocket, you know, for his successes. And, you know, he pocketed in four different things while he was there. And I, I just thought, wow, you know, that's like this sense of, you know, you were successful, you were the top of your class, you were this, you were that. Well, were you a good, did you have fun? Were you a good person? Would somebody enjoy spending time with you? You know, um, it's it, it's like, that's what's important. And we, we've lost that and we're so caught up in productivity. And, and then we keep on thinking, oh, I need to do more, like what you just said. I should have done more last year. I could have done more. I should have done this. I should have done that. You know, um, you know, and and maybe we shouldn't have. And maybe um, can we be a good friend? Can we mm. can we find time where we're just happy, breathing? You know, and isn't that enough? Maybe yeah. it is. You know. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know how we get away from productivity. I don't know how we get away from those very seductive rewards of uh, a high salary or my name in print. You know, people say, oh my God, it must be so wonderful to go into a bookstore, see your name in print. And I think, oh no, actually, it's kind of terrifying because, you know, I see it and I think, oh, should I really said that? Or could I have said that one sentence differently? Or, you know, somebody asked me, do you listen to your podcast? I go, no, not so much, you know, I'm glad to do them, but I, I don't need to listen to myself to feel yeah. good about what I've done. Yeah, absolutely. That is so true. Totally relatable for me hosting these podcasts. I don't listen to them right? <laughs> most of the time. I, I mean, sometimes I really want to kind of like, okay, I need to learn something again from that previous podcast that I've done, but I'm terrified of listening to myself. So I just skip the part where I speak and I listen to the guest that's easier for me because I'm like, I just, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's actually really terrifying, like you were saying, so true. But you know, you pointed out something interesting there uh, based on what we just discussed, which is that, you know, the, the current culture of productivity where we need to have, it seems like we have this pressure and we need to produce more, we need to achieve more for, for us to have a sense of well-being and happiness. But in fact, you said it yourself, it's, it, that's not the case. In fact, we have to kind of get away from that. So it's one of the biggest misconceptions that I think people have, right? When you achieve more, you have a better sense of well-being. So that's one of the biggest ones. What are some of the other misconceptions you think people have? Well, I, I think they uh, unfortunately begin to believe that their uh, titles, you know, their job titles, what they achieve are, are them, you know, that they are their job title. Yeah. Um, and that that is their pocket, you know, they've pocketed. I, I have to catch myself uh, sometimes, you know, when I'm talking to my kids, I'll say, so, so what did you do today? No, that's not, I, I shouldn't be asking them to give me a list of the, their productivity. I should be asking, did you have, you know, did you have a good time? Did you talk to anybody interesting? Did you, did you connect? Did you connect with yourself? Did you connect with the world? Which is, I think, a conversation you and I had about, you know, um, and I, I find what's happened with uh, COVID to be quite scary to me that I hear so many of my friends talk about their difficulty of reconnecting. You know, um, I've had two or three people say, you know, well, I finally reconnected with this person who I thought was my best friend forever. And I was having coffee with her and I was thinking, ah, I don't, you know, do I, do I really like this person? <laughs> uh, why did I like this person? And 
you know, I think that the connecting and reconnecting and the disconnecting from work, the disconnecting from the idea that I am a good person because I have nine books. I'm not a good person because I have nine books. I'm a good person because um, I listen and I, you know, am a fairly good friend. And, um, you know, I, I, I try to steal more time than I spend time, I think, which is fun. Ah. I'm getting really good at it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And you're per you just provided us with the perfect segue into the next question about today's topic. Yeah. Well, that, well now let's talk about stealing time because it's true. We are not having as much time to connect, not even to connect with ourselves nowadays. And I think you were saying earlier, some some of us have troubles connecting with people that we thought that we have such great connections with. So it's like a it's like a global problem, I, I feel, um, at least from my perspective, having talked to quite a few people. So what is that concept of stealing time? What does that mean in the context of well-being? Well, I thought it was interesting in the list of questions that you gave me, and, and I don't remember which question it is right now, but basically, um, it, you know, it was like, can, how do, what's the best way to schedule your stolen time? And I went and go, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's the wrong idea. You know, if you, a good example that I came up with was, let's say that after listening to this podcast or reading my book or whatever, you decide that what brings you happiness, where you feel centered, where you feel yourself without all your labels is when you're walking in the park looking for birds or whatever. And so being the, you know, person that we are these days, we'll schedule that into our calendar. Two o'clock in the afternoon, I take a half an hour break and I go and walk through a park for half an hour. That's not how this works. Because what happens if someone calls you at two o'clock when you're supposed to scheduled to go have some stolen time and you say, I'm sorry, I can't have tea with you today because that falls right in my stolen time time. Well, that's a misconception because the time you would have spent with that other person, that's stolen time. You've, you've left your regular scheduled time, you know. I think that uh, it's time for all of us to read Tom Sawyer again and playing hooky, you know, and the idea of skipping out. Except for, I, I find that young people, um, I was talking to somebody the other day, one of my children's friends, and I, and I say children, but they're grown people. Um, and they were talking about, uh, well, you know, I'm going to have to go back to the office, which means I can't like, you know, step out and just go to coffee or whatever with somebody pretend that I'm working. Um, maybe there were some good things in terms of having to work at home, except for I think we all worked like maniacs when we were at home because we felt just like, here I am, I'm in this house, I have to do this. If I go outside, I have to wear a mask. So chop, chop, I'm going to be so productive. I'm going to show my yeah. boss I can be protected with home and I want to go, what are we thinking, you know? It's, we should all learn to play hooky and not, we should not schedule our stealing time. We should just kind of stumble into it and say, ah, here's an opportunity to step away from my productive life, even for 15 minutes or eat for an hour to have lunch yeah. with somebody. And we all say, oh, we should do lunch sometime. You know, Lou, you and I, we should have coffee sometime. Yeah. We're not going to do it. We live on two different continents. <laughs> uh, but uh, and I, I did try having drinks with people on Zoom and I'm sorry, it's not very satisfying, you know? <laughs> I know. I hear yeah. you. It just isn't, you know, there's something about sitting there with your glass of wine, you know, chatting with people and I'm like, it's better than nothing, but it's scheduled, you know, we're so, I think my, the point of my article was let's get away from our scheduled lives. Let's get away from our need to show what we've produced, what have we done in that day. Yeah. It would be great to say nothing, nothing but thought about my future, nothing but left with my grandchildren, nothing mm. but, oh, I had tea with a good friend I hadn't seen in two years. That's stealing time. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think I, I love that so much because all my life I had been this person that schedules pretty much everything. 
And it's kind of crazy now that I think about it because I used to be like even more rigid than I am now where, you know, like I would have like a list of things to do. Like before the Google calendar days for me, I used to have like this to-do list and the day is a success if I've ticked everything off. And everything goes according to that plan. I was that kid, you know, because I was a really good <laughs> kid at school. <laughs> and it turns out I didn't know how to enjoy life. So I've kind of like stepped away from that a little bit and have more fun. So now I schedule fun in my life. But then I realize, hang on a minute. But then what, a, you know, what about the time that I have in between all of the activities that I have in my diary? And then I started to feel guilty about the fact that, oh, maybe I'm not going to do something. Like if I'm not reading a book, what am I doing with my life? I should be reading. If I'm not going for a walk, when I, what am I doing with my life? And then you mentioned something about work as well. I was like, oh, actually, that is so true. Because when I started working, it was actually the pandemic. And I basically just worked. And I was at my desk all day. I had no social interaction. And work was basically my life. And so when I started to go back to the office, it started to be like a little uncomfortable to start having water cooler chats or having coffees with colleagues because I was like, oh, yeah, we're having active. Oh my God, we're still yeah, yeah. In my in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, I'm really enjoying this conversation, but I should be getting back to my task. Right. And that's kind of like that's like anxiety, like productivity anxiety. And for the past year, it's been so apparent to me. I'm like. Oh, today I didn't. I didn't do X, Y, Z. I didn't read this book that I meant to read. Right. I didn't research this project that I was supposed to do, and so the list goes on. And when you mention that concept of stealing time and just doing whatever it is, and not not because of scheduling, and intentionally steal time, but actually be a bit more spontaneous with it, I'm like, it's hard, you know. That's actually really hard to do. And I think we 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 no longer. I think we've lost that idea of how to be spontaneous, you know, how to be um, just, you know, if it's not on our schedule or yeah. it's not in my, I'm one of those, I'm one of those dinosaurs. I, I don't keep it in my phone because I think that would haunt me if, I, if my phone was always telling me, you need to be here now. <laughs> so I, I have a paper calendar and I, you know, write things down in that and then if I don't do them, I erase them. I don't, you know, I don't allow them to sort of say to me, oh, you didn't do that. Mm. You know, and you didn't write those three pages. And if I ever wrote in my thing, write three pages on this today, I didn't do it. I would, instead of having that stare at me, I would erase it off my calendar. I already write mm. my calendar in pencil. So I'm not shamed ever by um, what I didn't do, you know? Yeah, I love um, that. Yeah, except for... If I don't sweep the kitchen floor these days, the ants come, which is about ready to drive me crazy. But that's a, <laughs> or that's a whole podcast. <laughs> well, I'm killing the ants in my kitchen. But, you know, I think the the lack of spontaneity, um, w which had a lot to do with the mask, because you had to remember to take the mask with you. You had to remember to put the mask on. You had to remember to wash your hands. You had to remember not to, you know, if somebody was coughing, to step away from them. You had to remember not to do, you know, so you, we had to remember so many things to keep ourselves safe. And then we had to remember to be productive, you know, mm. um, because we had all day to work. You know, we couldn't do these foolish things. And I think we need to do some more foolish things. I think we need oh, to, you know. I love that. The, um, my sister-in-law went to Smith College and um, they have a, a wonderful tradition at Smith. I think they're still, I hope they're still doing it. And that is on the most perfect day in autumn, where the leaves are absolutely at their peak and the weather is crisp and clear and beautiful, the president of Smith will ring a bell and all classes will be canceled that day so that people can just be outside and enjoy the colors and the autumn smell. And boy, don't we need bell ringers? You know, wouldn't it be great if there was a town crier who went through and said, Lou, get up, get up. Turn your computer off. It's beautiful outside. Go up, <laughs> you know, go walk in the park, go mm -hmm. take a blanket and sit on the ground and, you know, just do nothing. When we lived in Brisbane, we would go um, on, I think, Wednesday or Thursday after school, uh, we'd pick up our son and uh, he was a climber, you know, a rock climber. 
and we would go down to the river, um, to the cliffs there. And we would, we would pick up a sandwich on the way there and we would just sit there and, um, watch the flying foxes come in and the boats go around and watch the climbers and do nothing. We would do nothing but enjoy the beautiful weather in Brisbane. And what a gift that was that we knew that on that Wednesday, even though it was kind of scheduled because it was in conjunction with him climbing, um, we didn't take any books with us. We didn't take the computer with us. We didn't take the phones with us. We just sat there and enjoyed the river. And that was a real lesson, you know, and we don't do that, you know. How often do we do that? I'm also on a campaign, which I mentioned in the article, to, um, you know, to go out with my husband like once a day, um, leave the house and go to a coffee shop. And everybody says, well, well, I mean, wait a minute, that's kind of expensive if you do that every day. And, you know, what are you doing there? And you could just make coffee or tea at home. And I'm like, no, you know, you have to get out. You have to be someplace else where you're not obligated to answer a phone or the ding on your computer or whatever. And so now we've become, I don't know, maybe a, there were a special, you know, coffee shop rats or something, but <laughs> just about every day to some tea shop or coffee shop. And sometimes we take the New York Times and sit and read the Times and have tea together, but it's away from our home. It's a different place. And that changes how you spend that time. Yeah, definitely. Actually, you you remind me because I, I really love going to coffee shops. And yeah, sometimes I bring a book, but I don't read it. Sometimes I bring, bring the book and I actually read it. Sometimes I just go and look at people and enjoy my coffee. And I, I don't know, there's something about it that really helps me. Maybe I just am the kind of person that likes going out more than the average person. Well, I, but I think it's good. I mean, I yeah, think maybe now that you're saying that, I think it might be a good thing, actually. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. I think, and you know, um, I, I love that, you know, uh, it, I love that idea of taking the time to have a cup of tea, tea time, you know? Yeah. I mean, in Brisbane, you know, classes would stop things that we did, you know, and everybody would go to the tea room and, and make a cup of tea and sit and talk. If you don't have those unscheduled conversations, if you don't have it in your time, today we will talk about using <laughs> Haynes Gray to, you know, mix with white to make certain things. But, you know, if you don't have that, if you just have tea time and you go and you have conversations, the world becomes so much bigger. You know, you, ideas are discussed. Um, and you listen to other people and that's how you grow, you know, oddly enough, that's how you become more productive. If you want to have it as a productive quotient, because the world becomes bigger. And I think that stealing time makes the world bigger, you know? Yeah, definitely. That's such a great thing to say. So, you know, it, it makes the world bigger, but um, in in this podcast, we are touching on well-being a lot, right? So for our audience, who's kind of like hesitant, because a lot of people are scared of spontaneity, for, for those that are hesitant to do so, what would you say to be the key benefits of stealing time, you know, for our well-being? How would it still, how would us stealing time impact our well-being? I think it would make you more curious about the world and it would make you feel like you had a worth that was different than your productive, your quotient, you know, mm -hmm. that your worth was just, you, you were enough, just who you are is you are enough. I, I like that idea when people say, you know, well, are you good enough? And you would say, yeah, I, I really am. I really am enough. You know, I'm not a, a New York Times bestseller, but you know, I, I'm enough. And um, I think that stealing time gives you a chance to step back from yourself and discover what's good about you, you know, not, you know, are you the best cookie baker in the world or are you the best anything? You know, are you number one in the law firm? Well, you know, the only thing that that gets you is a bigger paycheck. And what is that bigger paycheck going to get you? you know, a bigger house, 
a bigger swimming pool. I don't know. But are you enough? And I think that stealing time gives you uh, a chance to learn more about yourself to, you know, and, and that is uh, a way to build a sense of well-being, you know. The more you learn about yourself, the more you like yourself. You know, can you like yourself? Can you sit still? Sometimes I tell people that um, I think for creative people that, or for anybody, not, not just creative people, sometimes you just need to sit in a dark closet by yourself and get away from the world and have a chance to just, you know, find out, are you enough? You know, do you have this in you? Are, you know, are you enough? Uh, are you happy enough with who you are? Can you be by yeah. yourself? And then can you be with other people? Totally. I think that connection is such a big piece of well-being. We've talked about that quite a bit on, on this show. You know, it's not just connection with other people, but connection with yourself is the most important thing, which we lack when it comes to well-being. Because um, it comes right back to your definition earlier, right? You were saying, are you comfortable with yourself? Well, sometimes we don't even know if we're comfortable with ourselves because we're too busy running around. We don't steal time for ourselves. And um, I think sometimes it's good to distract ourselves when we need to, you know, kind of like, um, we need to kind of zone out of certain areas that we don't want to kind of get stuck in too much. But at other times when we run away too much, then we don't steal time for ourselves. We don't connect with ourselves. We don't really know what it is that's going on. So I think that's, that's an interesting point you raised there. Yeah. And you asked another question, which I thought was a very good question, which is, um, what are the uh, what are the things that you can do? Um, you know, it, and I thought, well, then all of a sudden we're slipping back into productivity. And mm. then I was trying to think about myself. What are the things that um, kind of get me centered? That are just for me? That give me a moment to sort of to to just be, you know, myself and. Um, Many years ago, uh, I um, I decided to go back to. You asked me about school, uh, and I, you know, um, I decided to go back to school at to the um, community college, which I uh, I'm trying to say the TAFE, which would be a TAFE in Australia, mm -hmm. and um, I got my certification. I'm a certified florist, and I learned. Uh. You know, I learned all of that, um, and I took the two or three semester course, and I have a somewhere in my files I have my certification, and I have a license um, that I don't use it, but you know, I have a I'm a licensed florist, and I did that just for myself um, because I love flowers and I wanted to know more, and I actually uh, have worked with um, a wonderful Ikebana artist in in Brisbane and um, Lily Kamnitz and it, Lily and I have done some projects, some art uh, shows together. Um, and so she taught me about Ikebana and every week, every week, no matter what, I have a moment where I, you know, if I'm in Oberlin, I have a garden there. I cut greenery and flowers here in DC. I don't have a garden, so I go to a store. And I buy flowers. And the most important thing I do, I don't care, you know, before I cook dinner, before I do anything else, I do my flowers. And I do flower arrangements for my house. And I love it. And it's just for me. It's not for anybody else. And it's not a scheduled time. It's when the flowers look good. It's when the flowers are dead and I need to get new ones or whatever. But it's kind of like a, a ritual for me. And I was thinking about how rituals, uh, personal rituals can help us find that stolen time. And when I do flowers, you know, my kids and my husband know eh, she's busy, you know, don't ask her anything. That's her time. And I guess that's a little bit of a meditation for me. And I think that we have gotten away in our, uh, got far away from sort of ritual activities uh, Shabbat, for instance, you know, or um, just the a, a ritual activity of doing flowers for yourself, 
or yoga or whatever that gives you a moment, a breathing moment, and that maybe maybe it's time that we we try to create a ritual for ourselves. And I think that would be an entryway into stealing time. As long as you don't put it on your schedule, as long as you don't <laughs> have to do this, you know, but when it feels right to do it, you know, don't become obsessed with my ritual is I do this every day and I have to do this every day. So I don't do this every day. I'm not a good person. That's not it. You know, it's like um, making a ritual of, of going out for coffee or tea with a good friend once a week or um, with your spouse or with one of your children or with a colleague. I think that people who started their careers like you did from working from home lost the connection and the richness of having those moments where you are working and you can turn to somebody else and say, hey, when do you think about this? Yeah. I'm going to have a conversation that takes you someplace else. And I think that that's also a stolen moment where it's a conversation that's off task, but it, it, it makes the situation richer, I guess. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the, the thing that we don't have when it comes to remote work. It's really hard. You cannot really go, oh, I have this idea or like I have this random question and then it becomes something so much more and it expands your world, right? And it's, it's just hard nowadays um, with virtual teams. So I've been really enjoying, you know, going into the studio, doing the podcast. And sometimes I would turn to Aiden and I'll be like, hey, what do you think about this? And I have a, a random question. Or, you know, like I would, you know, catch up with other hosts in the studio and then we would have a random five minute chat about something that would make my day. And I think, I think in, in that sense, we were stealing time without knowing. And I think that's really nice. Yeah. And, you know, so what happens when you're working by yourself and you have one of those questions? What do you do? You don't have a colleague to ask. So you get your phone out and you ask Siri or you look it Google. up on the internet. And so yeah. we've, we've gotten into this loop of, oh, well, I can just, I can just find it here. And, um, you know, and so we think, well, I don't need to have that conversation. I don't need to call my best friend and say, so when you're making fried green tomatoes, how do you do that? How do you make them stay together? You know, um, what is barramundi? What does that fish look like? Is it big or is it small? Oh, I don't need to ask anybody because I can look it up on the internet. Yeah. And, um, I was just uh, recently thinking how much I miss my flip phone, you know, because it did <laughs> nothing. <laughs> <laughs> phone calls. And it was so glorious, you know, and I, I could flip it off and yeah. uh, felt very powerful with it. Yeah. And, you know, now like everybody, I have, you know, a smartphone. We had a very funny thing happen a couple of days ago, uh, a couple of months ago, actually. I like to read in bed in the morning. It's a luxury that I have now that, um, you know, uh, it's just a nice luxury. So I like to read the paper in bed or whatever. And my husband came into the bedroom and I said to him, what time is it? You know, because I didn't know how long I'd been, you know, reading. And I'd been caught up in this story. And he said, oh, it's it's 720. And the phone, now we have never used Siri. We don't turn her on. I can't stand that stuff. His phone who was on his night, that was on his nightstand said, no, it's not 720, it's 725. And oh, wow. Like, what? I mean, you, you were listening, you know. Oh I'm, my God. That must have been phone. It was scary. Very, it was, yeah, that our phone corrected my husband as to what time it was. But we are so, you know, and we feel like, that phone connects us, you know, and it doesn't, it disconnects us. You asked another question, which I thought was a very good question about how do we manage our electronic worlds in stealing time? And um, as you well know, the political scene in the United States is messy at best and terrifying at worst. And I, like everyone else I know, have become totally addicted to what is he doing today? What's going on? Is he in jail yet or not? Whatever. And, I, you know, it was like I'd wake up at 5.30 or 6 o'clock and the first thing I would do before I looked at the weather is find out what had happened while I was sleeping. You know, what had happened in the world while I was sleeping. And I would go to Twitter 
or now it's called X or yeah. whatever. And I thought <laughs> one morning I, I woke up and I thought, this is horrible. This is really awful. This is ruining, this is taking up so much space in my brain. I don't have that much space in my brain. And I am allowing this to just eat away at me. And so I removed Twitter from my phone. I can't access it anymore. It's gone. I can Yay. post things on it from my computer, but I can't read anything on it. It's the best thing I've ever done for myself. It's like done, one and done, done. Mm. And I, you know, I find myself saying, well, maybe there's a workaround. Maybe I can get that information. And I'm like, let it go. Let it go. So I read it in the newspaper in the morning. Uh, I'm addicted to the newspaper. So that's a, that's another addiction. Um, yeah. But, you know, how do we disconnect and how do we quit asking the phone? How do we quit asking the India to answer our questions when we could have called a friend and asked or said to somebody, let's have coffee. Oh, and while we're having coffee, could you explain to me, blah, blah, I don't understand this, you know? And um, so I think that that's, that's what I would do. I would tell people, you know, kill your phone. They're, you know, in the 60s, they used to say, kill your television. Um, and, uh, you know, when Richard Dixon was being indicted, you know, I realized that he was coming into my, I had a little television set, very little television set. And um, that was before the days of computers they got. And um, the nightly news, I would turn the news on. And I was just, I had, you know, it was like people would say, blah, blah, blah. They say, oh, nope, I gotta go home and watch the news. I gotta find out what's going on. And so one day I thought, I don't want Richard Dixon in my living room anymore. He's killing me. He's taking my brain cells away. So I put him in a hallway closet because I had a plug in the hallway closet. So I put him in the hallway closet and I would sit on the stairs if I, and I would punish my, if I wanted to watch the news, I had to sit on the stairs and open the closet door and watch him from the, and one night I thought, this is crazy. This is really crazy because I'm allowing this person to take up this much space with me. So I unplugged my television set and I took it outside and I put it on the curb and somebody stole it or took it. You know, it was like free. I gave it away. And I didn't have a television set for 15 years after that. It was- wow. Wow. About that with the computer that messed up tonight, but you know, it's, it's, uh, how do you disconnect and disconnecting these days feels even more challenging. Like if we disconnect, you know, what does that mean? You know, what will we miss? Uh, well, I think, yeah, I think it's just something that we're so used to nowadays, but, um, we can change it, you know, like sometimes it takes a hiking, camping weekend away for you to realize that nothing's going to change if you don't get access to the internet for 24 to 48 hours. So, you know, we can stretch that out even further. And I'm learning as well, you know, as, as a young person, I'm learning to not be so addicted to my phone anymore. Um, and I and know you that- you up with it, you know, that, that's that been your whole world. Actually, is I didn't. Personally, I didn't grow up with a phone, so ah. I, I, I really miss the days when, that I didn't have uh, a smartphone because I would call my friends, landline calling and, you know, have a conversation for an hour and there was no screen involved. I wasn't multitasking because what I've realized now is sometimes when I'm on the phone with my friends, they would pause and then I'm like, hello, are you still there? And then they're like, oh, sorry, just looking at something because, you know, you can I multitask. Know, because right? you can. So, I, yeah. And... You know, and you can get other messages. And, yeah. um, you know, I started writing professionally in the uh, mid 60s and in 1967. And, you know, at that time, you know, I had a Smith Corona typewriter and, you know, you had to type things out. And then you had to, you know, you get an assignment and you type them out. And then you would fold it up and you would put it in an envelope and you would send it to the editor. And that would take two or three days. And then the editor would get it. Then the editor would read it and then the editor would, oh my God, pick up the phone and call you and you would have a conversation with yeah. an editor. Yeah. And they would say, yeah, we really liked what you did, but we want a sidebar of 200 words about blah, blah. And you say, oh, great. That sounds perfect. That, 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 you know, you do the sidebar, you send that to them. Two or three days pass. 
editor calls you. We like the sidebar. Perfect. Can you make a couple corrections in the other part? No problem. Make those connections. So the result of that was I had time to think. I had time to think about the story I was writing. I had time to think about, well, how could I make that sidebar better? Could I, what about this? And I could actually, believe it or not, pick up the phone and call the editor and talk to him or her and say, what would you think about this? And we would have what is normally called a conversation. I haven't had a conversation with an editor in so long, you know, other than a chat on the on my computer. Um, then it's like, it, I feel disconnected sometimes from the work I'm doing, um, particularly for magazines and whatever, because there's not that communication. Communication comes in a text or an email or, um, you know, or if you don't hear from us in two weeks, it means we didn't like what you did. End of story. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a very dehumanizing thing, you know. I don't hear yeah. my days with the Smith Corona typewriter, however, you know. Yeah, but I think it's interesting perspective to hear from you because so much has changed since then. And the more you explain that, the more I just think, oh, my God, like if I don't respond to, uh, let's say, my boss's messages within a few minutes, he would probably be wondering and send me a follow up message. Where are you, for example? Right. It's like, that, that's very normal nowadays because people can see if you're online and people can see if you have seen the message and it, if you're focusing on a task, but they cannot really see you right there working on the task. It, you know, it's kind of like. That I'm has being productive, you know. Yeah, what? exactly. So that has your time well. You that know? has changed so much, and I think it, to to be patient, to kind of wait for a response, um, is is a virtue nowadays. And you yeah. know, I, I try to honor that. Working with my colleagues, you know, if they don't respond to me straight away, they're probably working on something else, and that's totally okay. Um, but it's hard to learn because I know that for other people, they could. You know, sometimes they could just get really frustrated and they can kind of go, where is this person? <laughs> they are right there working, but they're not responding, you right. know? You know, then your phone bings twice, you know, it's like, yeah. didn't you get the message? Didn't you get the message? Yeah. And then follow up message. So where are we now? You know? When it, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's different. And, and, um, and, and we've learned to respond to it, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I don't say, hey, get off my case, you know, um, give me give me time to think this through um, because I want the job, you know. Mm. You can't say, you need to give me more time yeah. because their response will be, we can get somebody else to do this faster. Mm. That is so true. You know, this is actually really tricky nowadays. And, and the more I think about it, the more it it sounds to me like, it's not just about stealing time for yourself in your personal daily lives. It it expands and extends to other things, other aspects in life too, because we're we're always in hurries nowadays, right? And I know we've covered a lot of different aspects of stealing time, um, but to close out the podcast, we always have a practice section for our audience. So if you were to suggest something practical to our audience, I know we call it a practice, but I feel like it might be a little silly thinking about, okay, how can we practice stealing time? Because that's probably beside the point and probably not even what you were trying to say to us. Um, so I would reframe the question by saying, what would be a practical thing that we can try to embrace um, knowing that we can and should steal time? Obviously you said don't schedule it, but then how do we make sure that we are, you know, act proactively um, doing that, stealing some time for ourselves? Yeah. Well, I think that um, stealing time is often doing something out of the ordinary. You know, what is your ordinary? And then kind of say, well, what is something that I wouldn't, that's not on my schedule, you know? What um, can, I, I don't know if young people, you know, I, I have three grown kids they work so hard, they make my head swim. I mean, it's like, whoa, 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 <laughs> you know, let's just lighten up here. But then I'm worse than they are, you know, because um, I'm still working. And, you know, uh, like, you know, when you asked that question about, you know, the word book, my first response was, no, I don't want to do any more of this. I think to, to just stop and say, uh, 
can I do something that's not on my list? You know, what is not on my list? Um, if I always, you know, uh, Julie Cameron, who, you know, uh, wrote the book about, you know, uh, writing, whatever, creativity. Um, she said, you know, what is it? She recommends having an artist date, which is doing something that you normally wouldn't do to get you out of your normal realm and to get you out. And I think to step away from your productive life, you know, and um, to do something that's out of the ordinary. And it doesn't have to be like all day. It could be a half an hour out of the ordinary. Um, for instance, let's say that because of COVID, you've just gotten in the habit of um, ordering your grocery stores from Costco or whatever, and your groceries, and they come to your apartment or your to home and you pick them up at the front door. So what happens if you uh, decide to go to a store you've never been to uh, or I don't know, just something out of the ordinary to to get away from our the rut that we're living in and to find something different that sparks sparks your you know, get your brain working, gets you know, that's that where people aren't going to do what you want because you're a lawyer or a doctor or you know, be your friend because you're a writer. I mean, I almost never tell people that I'm a writer. I don't often tell people that I'm an artist either. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, because then they look at you like, oh, you know, you're a writer. And you're like, I, you know what? Just get over that. I'm just a person. You know, I'm somebody, I always say I'm somebody's mother. That's it. You know, that's all I am. Um, because we have to get away from our labels. We have to get away from believing that that's who we are and to be somebody else. Yeah. You know, to, Ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. I, I really needed that, at least for myself. Not sure about our audience, but I think we all need to think about how this is going to work for us because I, as I said, schedule pretty much everything and sometimes feel guilty. It's it's the feeling part that's the most, like the most dangerous part and also the trickiest part to get over. You know, it's just not feeling guilty for doing something not on my schedule. Like that's hard. Yes. I'm learning. It's really hard. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because this <laughs> yeah. is not easy. I mean, this isn't like, like, you know, oh, this is a piece of cake. Just do this. You know, it's hard. It is yeah. hard. Yeah. And not only that, but I think it's scary for some people. I mean, I think it's scary to step out of, out of the titles that we have, you know, to just be somebody, um, just be ourselves. So we don't have to be somebody, you know, we can just be ourselves. Yeah. That should be enough. Um, yeah. But that's a scary thing, you know, because the question is, is it really enough? Are we really enough? Um, and um, I don't know, you know. So true. Um, it is true. But it, and it's hard. And I think that the world is complicated. And, you know, in the paper today, it said there's another COVID coming. And what does that mean? Do we all rush back to our houses and, and, you know, hide. Um, I think we have to quit hiding. I think we have to mingle. Um, and then, you know, the hiding thing makes it those people and I'm one of these people and those people are those people. And, you know, we need to talk to each other or we're going to just have a world that we're not going to live in, you know, that mm -hmm. we're going to be afraid to go outside on. Yeah. Um, it's interesting when, when we live in, when we're in D.C., I, I don't want to drive in this city. Trust me. Oh my gosh. You know, everybody is in a rush because everybody has two telephones here. You know, they're like, they're like cowboys, you know, they have these two. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, cause they're all, you know, on the hill and they're all doing all this important stuff, <laughs> personal phone, or business phone, and bam, you know, and they drive like freaking maniacs. So I don't want to drive. I, you know, we come here, I park the car. That's it. I take public transportation with my husband everywhere. And that means that we have to sit on a bus with other people. And sometimes we talk to them and, um, you know, and that's okay. You know, it's, and, you know, we don't say, hi, um, I'm sitting next to you and you may not know it, but I'm a famous writer. And um, so who are you? 
you know, because you, you don't say that. That would be such a jerky thing to do, you know. You're just trying to be a good person for that moment, you know. If a, if a mother is struggling to get a, you know, a, a stroller onto the bus, you stop what you're doing and you help her get the stroller on the bus. And you don't say to her, well, I'm a famous person or I'm a lawyer or I'm a doctor and now I'm helping you and aren't you grateful? No, you know, you're just a person. To be just a person for a moment, that would be fantastic. That would be what I tell people to do is just for one moment of the day, be just a person. Definitely. I really love that. And thank you so much for, for sharing that with us and for your energy of being here today. You know, it's been so wonderful chatting to you. Um, I learned so much more than just stealing time, actually. So much to think about. And for our audience, uh, I, I know that, you know, your, your work is probably everywhere. But for our audience who you probably don't know about you and want to find out more about your work, where should they go? Um, the best place to go is my website, which you have that. It's uh, C-J-A-N-E-W-O-R-K, C-J-A-N-E-W-O-R-K, and um, dot com. And, you know, you can find me on, you know, Amazon.au. Um, you can, if you go to my website, you can find all the other things that I do and, uh, um, which is good. And, you know, uh, you were asking about my latest book. I think the, the last book that I had come out was um, the one from the site today, the first 50 columns I wrote for Psychology Today. And uh, so, you know, you could find that. And you could also go um, to my, my website and you can link into the site today and you can read, once you link into my column, which is shifting forward, you could read all the columns if you want. You know, you can just bing, bing, bing all the way through them. And uh, what else? Just, you know, all the books are listed there. And, um, you know, I've, it's still summer here. You're in winter, aren't you? You're... We're in spring, actually. Oh, well, congratulations. That beautiful blue day when you wake up and the air is... Yes, crisp. thank oh, you. I love that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. We to treat, you know, everybody's mm. like, wait till spring. Yeah. And then all yeah. of a sudden, like there was no humidity. The sky was blue. Oh, it was so, it was so glorious, you know? Yeah. It's amazing. I've been loving it because Melbourne winter was dreadful. So I'm so glad spring is here. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, it is hot as Hades here, let me tell you. <laughs> it been really, really eye-opening you know it's like I say to myself you need to get out of the house and then we go out and then you know you just come back dripping and you think okay fine no I'm done I'm done I'm done <laughs> um, yeah <laughs> um but uh yeah you know I like my short stories uh black tie optional is a group of stories all of them won different prizes at different places um I have kind of a racy book called the musical affair uh I actually, with my older son, uh, we ran an international music festival for five years. And so some of the stuff in that book comes from real life, you know? Everything. Oh, nice. So anyway, there's lots of fun things to read if you yeah. like. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people find the Alzheimer's book very useful. That's on there as well. So, yeah. yeah so you can find out about me. Keep up with awesome. what I'm doing. Yeah, very diverse bodies of work. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here this late as well. I know it's getting later and later in the day. <laughs> yeah, it's your bedtime, isn't it? So thank you for being here. Um, I know you're probably going to head straight to bed after, but still enjoy the rest of your day. I and will. thank you for joining us with such lovely energy. You're welcome. I appreciate it. You have been listening to Doing Well, the Wellbeing Science Insights podcast produced by the Wellbeing Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 Life Management Perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website, we.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Lungo. Thanks for tuning in.